Hi, everybody. This is Jim Wagner in Newton Little Falls, as you know. And I'm here really tonight just to kind of uh, kick off the discussion by Gary Brzezinski about climate change. And he will be sharing some of his expertise with us, <clears throat> expertise with us, particularly concerning uh, legislation. It's very important. Um, we will, um, I will ask Gary a number of questions as he describes the legislation and other work that he's doing with the uh, citizens climate lobby. And uh, then if you have questions, we will have a, a, a chat feature. You can ask during, I mean, you can type in really while Gary is speaking. And then afterward, uh, it'll just be open and uh, for questions to direct, directly to Gary, <clears throat> who is being assisted by a couple of other friends, uh, Laura and uh, Greg from the uh, citizens climate lobby. So, uh, Gary, the, you wanted to do um, an interview to um, it sort of grew out of an email that you had sent when we had a terrible big bad storm here in Newton Lower Falls and a lot of us, the rest of Newton. And uh, it, it got some folks interested. And I'd like to know, um, again, just what did you say in that email and, and why did you send that? Sure, thanks, Jim. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, the reason I sent that email was because, you know, we had that storm. I don't remember the day. Actually, um, I guess it was like October 7th. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had this storm that really blew through. I'm, and, you know, Lisa and I are sitting here um, in, in our house. Uh, it, it really didn't seem like very much. I mean, it got very windy. It got very dark. There was a little bit of rain. Mm -hmm. um, but it really, you know, the next day and that night, we started seeing emails from everybody about having lost power. We lost power for about two hours. Hmm. And so we were in the dark, but I think we were one of the lucky uh, ones because, you know, we only lost power for two hours. There were some people, I think, you know, almost a full day later, yeah. uh, still without power. And I was kind of shocked when I drove around the neighborhood the next day and I saw the number of uh, tree uh, tree companies and uh, trucks out in the neighborhood clearing trees that were down. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't really the first time that we've had a storm like this this year. And, um, you know, so I, you know, literally woke up in the middle of the night that night um, thinking about these storms that we've been getting, the number of trees that have been damaged in our neighborhood, the high winds, the mm -hmm. the the driving rains that we've been getting. And I knew that this was not uh, normal New England weather having grown up here. And um, that this was really an, the effect of climate change. And so, you know, I wrote in that email, I felt, um, I felt like this was, you know, whether it's a teachable moment or just a, maybe I just needed to get something off of my chest, I'm not sure. But um, so the next day when I woke up, I crafted this email that explained, you know, this type of weather, these types of damages are what we're going to be seeing more and more of uh, with climate change, that um, the climate scientists have been warning us about just this type of thing for the whole 30 years that Lisa and I have been living here in Lower Falls. And, you know, now the chickens are coming home to roost. And, and the other thing I threw in at the end was that, um, you know, it, even though we see these damages, people might still be hesitant to want to act on climate change because they hear a lot of stories, they read a lot in the press about how damaging it's going to be and how costly it's going to be uh, for us to, you know, get off of fossil fuels and transition to clean energy. And I think actually that it's not nearly as bad as people think. In fact, it's way, it's, uh, it's actually what I would call a win, win, win all the way down if we just adopt the right type of uh, climate legislation. And that's what I um, you know, mentioned that people could contact me and get involved in if they wanted to. Just what is the uh, legislation and, and how would it help with the climate change problem? Uh, well, the legislation is called the Energy Innovation Act. Uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. If somebody mm -hmm. wants to look it up, they can look it up as HR 763 in the House of Representatives. And the Energy Innovation Act would actually 
motivate uh, changes in the free market in our economy to actually uh, get us off of fossil fuels. And you know, climate change is caused primarily by carbon dioxide that's being emitted when we burn coal, oil, and natural gas. And what we really need to do in order to minimize future damages is we need to transition our whole economy away from fossil fuels and make much made greater use of conservation, efficiency, and uh, renewable energy. So I think the best way to illustrate the way that this legislation would work is um, that you know in 2008, when gas went to over $4 a gallon, mm -hmm. people changed their habits. So they started, we saw a spike in the use of public transportation, people started carpooling, uh, fuel efficient cars became much more popular. And at the same time, we saw the car companies decrease their uh, manufacturing of SUVs and, and uh, high, um, you know, low mileage vehicles. <clears throat> so the Energy Innovation Act would actually do the same thing. Um, it would use this price signal to motivate uh, companies to change their habits and their investment strategies and, and people, consumers, households to, uh, you know, push them more towards buying electric vehicles. Uh, again, maybe insulating their homes, going with high efficiency appliances, uh, something like that. With the, uh, this, this legislation, is, is this the uh, kind of thing that people say, yeah, you pass that and gasoline goes up to over four bucks a gallon and that sort of thing? Yeah, well, you know, they will <laughs> say that. There's no question about it. Um, but actually, you know, we wouldn't go to $4 a gallon immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually the way that the bill would work is it would put a gradually increasing fee on fossil fuels at the source, at the well, the, the mine head or the uh, port of entry. And that fee would be proportional to the amount of carbon dioxide that would be emitted when those fuels are burned. So initially, the fee would be set at $15 per ton of carbon dioxide emitted um, when, the, when those fuels are burned. And because coal is more carbon dioxide intensive than oil, and oil is more carbon intensive than natural gas, there'd be a, you know, this differential across the different types of fossil, fuel, fossil fuels. Uh, just to give you an idea, at $15 per ton of CO2, uh, that would re be reflected at the gas pump as about 15 cents per gallon. Mm. Oh. And probably not even that much. I mean, mm. maybe something between 10 and 15 cents. Um, and so, you know, like I said, when gas went to $4 a gallon, we saw people change their habits. Mm. Uh, 15 cents probably isn't going to do too much, but, but <laughs> companies and people knowing that this fee is going to go up every year thereafter is right. going to motivate them to begin uh, changing their habits now to avoid the future pain of those higher costs. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have a lot of the technologies that we need for people to avoid those higher costs if they want to. Um, so the fee would start at $15 per ton and go up $10 per year every year thereafter mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. emissions reach sustainable levels. And uh, an economic study that was done of this type of legislation said that, for example, we would drop 40% of our carbon emissions over the course of about 12 years wow. uh, as this bill started to kick in. Okay. So you're saying the, the fee will increase energy costs, which will make people use less energy, but it won't be, isn't that gonna be kind of rough on uh, poor people and even low income, moderate income people? The cost? Uh, yeah, so, you know, kind of two things about that. One is that, uh, first of all, as I've been saying, people will probably use less energy mm -hmm. because as the price of something goes up, they'll use less of it. But those increasing costs are going to motivate the free market, private investors, entrepreneurs, innovators, you know, to, to uh, invest their time and money in forming new companies that are gonna answer the needs. So, you know, we see a little bit of this already, right? Like Tesla's out there selling electric vehicles, selling batteries. We've got uh, 
companies producing windmills that are doing fairly well. We've got companies producing solar cells. All these technologies exist. We need, we just need for the people who know how to manufacture and install those things to have more of a price incentive to do that. So once they get the signal that the price of fossil fuels is going to be going up year after year, then private investors are going to be much more interested and willing to take their money, put it into those companies, and you know look for the next Google or the Apple or the Facebook of the uh, clean energy um, revolution. Now, in addition, you know we talked about poor people, uh, low moderate income households, and so on. So yes, if energy costs go up, that's going to hit those uh, households very hard. And so what the bill proposes is that 100% of the money that's raised from this fee would be returned to households on a per capita basis. Wow. That means every household in America gets exactly the same monthly dividend check from hmm. the proceeds. This is very similar to something called the Alaska Permanent Fund, where Alaska hmm. sells their uh, mineral rights, and then they get royalty payments from the mineral extractors and they take that money and redistribute it to all of the households in Alaska. Mm -hmm. So this would be the same on a national level. When you do that with this program, uh, about 60 to 70% of households actually either break even, the people at the kind of 60 mm -hmm. to 70% threshold, uh, or come out ahead because their carbon footprints are smaller than the energy price inflation that they're gonna experience mm -hmm. uh, because of this fee. So, uh, you know, the hard number to think about in that case is 60 to 70% of households, that's about $80,000 per year. Wow. So households earning less than $80,000 per year are gonna come out ahead with this bill. They're gonna have more money in their pockets uh, than they will otherwise. Mm -hmm. Now, while energy prices uh, go up for consumers, that means they also are going to go up for a small business, uh, local company, big corporations. Um, do they give a, do they get dividend checks too, or uh, how, how is that done? <laughs> Would that be nice? Yeah. Um, no, they don't get dividend checks. Um, you know, the whole purpose of this bill is to actually make it clear in in through this price signal about mm -hmm. where the carbon intensive Activ economic activities are. Mm -hmm. And so corporations are going to see their cost of goods, uh, cost of inputs and so on, start to go up. And they're going to have to ref either reflect that in the prices they charge for their products, or they're going to have to start to decarbonize their supply chains. Mm -hmm. So they will be incentivized to start looking for ways to get themselves off of fossil fuels or carbon intensive inputs to their businesses. Now, of course, um, you know, as energy prices rise here, there's gonna be a natural inclination as we've seen in the past, you know, when labor costs goes up, go up or energy costs go up here domestically, mm -hmm. corporations wanna move their operations offshore and then re you know, just import those uh, less expensive goods from abroad. Well, so what the bill proposes is that the Commerce Department would put a tariff on energy intensive goods that are being imported uh, from countries that don't have stringent climate policies in place. Mm -hmm. And similarly, if domestic industries are exporting to those cheap energy companies, I'll call them, uh, countries, then um, they will be subsidized. And that's a closed system. So the, the, the amount that's gathered from the tariffs will right. be used to subsidize, the tariff on imports will be used to subsidize the uh, exports. So it's a closed system. It keeps everybody domestically playing on a, a level playing field. And uh, so there's no need to any, do any further compensation of uh, hmm. domestic companies. So there'd be a, a fee, <clears throat> excuse me, and a dividend and a way to uh, <clears throat> a disincentive for companies to keep exporting jobs. Um, are there, <clears throat> I'm sorry about my voice. Are there other significant things in the bill that you'd like to highlight? Uh, there's really one other uh, really significant 
piece of, legis of, of the legislation. And that is mm -hmm. that um, you know, at Citizens Climate Lobby, we've wanted all of the legislation that we ever support to be bipartisan. Mm -hmm. That means we have to do something to get both Democrats and Republicans on board. Right. And um, so as the uh, sponsors of these bills were looking for co-sponsors back uh, at the end of 2018 and at the beginning of 2019, um, and they started talking with Republicans, Republicans said, you know what? We'd like to see some regulatory relief. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's in the bill is the idea of a regulatory moratorium by the EP on the EPA so that the EPA cannot institute any more regulations having to do with greenhouse gases um, because you know the Energy Innovation Act should be doing the job of controlling and reducing emissions. Mm -hmm. and so therefore, why would we want uh, redundant regulations to you know, introduce further costs for businesses? Well, if they had a 10-year moratorium, wouldn't that uh, be pretty upsetting to a lot of the environmentalists and uh, even other people who are uh, wanting to combat climate change? Yeah, it's not a very popular uh, position, <laughs> but of all of the regular of all the regulations, and and the, I, probably the one that's most um, familiar to people is something called the Obama Clean Power Plan, mm -hmm. and. The Energy Innovation Act is predicted to be nine times as powerful in reducing emissions as the Clean Power Plan was. Really? So that's a pretty good bargain, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. um, and then not only that, but at the end of the 10 year moratorium, the EPA would be required to do a study and see whether or not the act was meeting uh, an, an actual table of annual emission reductions that have okay. to happen between now and 2050. And if the act is not reducing emissions in accordance with that table of reductions, then all of the uh, regulatory power goes back into effect. And the EPA has to come out with regulations that will put us back on track and make us meet those mm -hmm. annual emission goals um, within two years. So it's a pretty strong uh, you know, reversion to uh, the, you know, the current status quo, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, in order to get back on track if, right. if things are not keeping up. Okay. So the, the moratorium is in effect for 10 years, is it you say for um, the, the initial period of 10 years for the moratorium? Right. If, we pass, if we pass the bill this year, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, then <clears throat> the EPA would be required to do that audit in uh, 2030. Okay. And then they wouldn't just be giving up responsibility because they'd be doing these other things you're talking about, to setting new guidelines uh, or, or new um, targets for the uh, for emissions from that point on. Is it correct? I mean, from that been, point, progress had been made at that up to that point. Right. Yeah. But even over that ten year period, the moratorium is only on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Right. So the EPA can still regulate, for example, automobile efficiency standards mm -hmm. uh, or control any of the other toxins that are released when we burn fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the EPA regulatory authority stays in place. The only thing that comes off or is, is pause is the uh, ability to in, implement new regulations that are specifically uh, motivated by the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Hmm, okay, so that sort of covers the basis for uh, greenhouse gas emissions and to get that under control. But um, what there's a big objection people have to a carbon tax. And they say it will be dangerous to the economy; it'll kill the economy. Um, are there predictions about how what will happen to the economy, how the economy would fare under this kind of a, a fee system and tax? Sure. Uh... So there was a study done in 2015 uh, about just this type of policy. And some of the numbers that it came out with were pretty stunning. So um, let's see. So for one thing, over the course of 20 years, it's going to create 2.8 million new jobs. Wow. Um, it's going to increase, over the course of 10 years, it's going to increase household incomes by $500. Um, 
what else is it going to do? It's going to reduce, uh, it will reduce emissions, as I mentioned, by uh, about 40% over 12 years and about 50% over 20 years. Uh, and it will help us avoid, uh, over the course of 20 years, it'll help us avoid about a quarter million premature deaths wow. that will otherwise be caused by, uh, you know, the, the other particulates primarily that we're pumping into the mm -hmm. atmosphere because mm -hmm. of, um, you know, our burning of fossil fuels. Okay. And not only that, but just recently there was a study done of a very similar plan to ours. Yeah. And that study came out and said there would be $1.4 trillion of private investment generated by this type of a policy. So if you listen to a lot of the political dialogue today, you'll hear about, um, you know, our, the presidential candidates over the course of this year we're proposing all of these multi-trillion dollar uh, spending plans mm -hmm. in order to address climate change and, and get emissions down. Well, we don't even have to spend, the government doesn't even have to spend a nickel in order mm -hmm. to get emissions down if it puts this type of policy in place. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're charging the fee, we're returning the fee to households and the free market, all the, the venture capitalists, the hedge funds, the bankers, mm -hmm. you name it, Mm -hmm. who are interested in, you know, making money and wanting to get in on a future mm -hmm. energy play uh, would have this opportunity and they would be able to justify those investments because oh. they know that the cost of fossil fuels is going to be going up and mm -hmm. batteries and windmills and solar power and potentially even nuclear power, uh, more fuel efficient vehicles and on and on and on mm -hmm. are all going to be more and more popular as years go by. And so this would be a great opportunity for them to start some new companies and get in on that. Yeah, and what did you say would be the number of, uh, approximate number of, of jobs that would be created during that time? Uh, 2.8 million over 20. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Um, it sounds good, it sounds, it sounds very good, um, but um, there's always uh, Congress to deal with <clears throat> to get these things passed. And there's been an awful lot of uh, opposition uh, particularly from the Republican Party on to climate change generally, even denying it, of course. So, uh, how do you? What are the chances of getting a bill like this passed in Congress? Either I know we're about to change Congress, but even even so, it's going to be difficult. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I've been doing this advocacy with Citizens Climate Lobby for ten years, hmm. and uh, you know, I will say for a long time, it it felt like. Um, you know, wandering in the wilderness. Um, but, you know, we have some pretty amazing people. And, you know, if anybody wants to learn more, I can uh, tell some stories. But um, back in, I think, 2016, 2017, something like that, uh, one of our volunteers managed to help form something called the Bipartisan Climate, Solu Climate Solution Caucus in the House of Representatives. Hmm. And that was a caucus that was formed of both Democrats and Republicans in equal numbers. Hmm. You couldn't join unless you brought somebody of the opposite party with you. <laughs> All right. And, uh, so they called it the Noah's Ark caucus. Um, that caucus got up to about 82 or 84 members at one point before hmm. the 2018 election. Hmm. Uh, so that was pretty amazing. And then in the lame duck session of tw in, in uh, 2018, I think it was the 115th Congress, um, two Republicans and three Democrats introduced our, how, our bill in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. A week later, uh, Jeff Flake, a Republican, and Chris Coons, a Democrat, introduced the same bill in the Senate Okay. Uh, in that lame duck session. Mm -hmm. so that was pretty amazing in itself. Since then, in January 2019, with the new Congress, the bill was again introduced by this time a Republican and three Democrats. Um, it's now up to about 82 co-sponsors, really? uh, most, you know, most of them Democrats, uh, and we're still with the same lone Republican co-sponsor. Um, oh. And then in addition to that, uh, in the Senate, we now have a bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus as well. Hmm. And that has 14 members, seven hmm. Republicans, six de Democrats, and one independent. Yeah. So, you know, this is something that's very underreported, uh, yeah. you know, in the press. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 
but there is there are these bipartisan conversations going on on Capitol Hill about mm -hmm. this type of legislation, and mm -hmm. particularly because of the fact that it's market-based, uh, uses the free market to address our need for emission reductions, mm -hmm. and really doesn't leave anybody behind. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does have, I believe, a lot of philosophical support on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. I think actually, um, you know, the Republicans are missing a huge opportunity right here because if all the predictions are true, you know, or, you know, the fact that the, the Senate is at risk of, uh, you know, for the Republicans and that it might be controlled by Democrats in the new Congress, mm -hmm. um, this December would be their opportunity to pass this type of legislation and take some of the air out of the sails of the, um, of the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily expect them to take advantage of that. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, read that the uh, that the Energy Innovation Act would um, also between like, now and it's, <clears throat> now and I think twenty fifty there'd be a, a huge reduction in emissions, like a, a ninety percent reduction in uh, in emissions from uh, well from uh, in carbon emissions. I mean, yeah, is that is that right? Was that right? So in the legislation, yeah, um, it sets. Uh, a goal yeah. that emissions in 2050 will be only 10% of 2016 levels. Yeah. So a full 90% reduction off of 2016 levels by 2050. And, you know, a lot of legislation sets that type of goal. We want to be <laughs> yeah. neutral by 2050. We want to be this by 2050 mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is one of the only bills that says, not only will we be there, but this is how we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the main mechanism is the price signal, the fee, and the dividend. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition, there's a table of annual reductions that must be met. So that means that uh, by something like 2024, mm -hmm. we will have to see uh, reductions of a certain level mm -hmm. and going on every year thereafter mm -hmm. uh, and not waiting until 2050 to find out, oh, we missed the target. Okay, now what are we going to do? Did uh, did the citizens climate lobby um, help to uh, draft the Energy Innovation Act? Because you seem to know an awful lot about it. How did you get involved in that? Well, this has been the policy that we've been pushing uh, okay. since the formation back in, I think it was probably 2008, mm -hmm. 2009, something like that. It was started by a guy named Marshall Saunders. Uh, who had done a lot of advocacy in the poverty area, mm -hmm. area of, of uh, relieving poverty, and then had gone on to do some micro lending. Mm -hmm. um, Marshall was very familiar with the, uh, the methodology that was used by an anti-poverty uh, group called Results. Mm -hmm. And Results, their methodology was based on training citizen volunteers to right. go and be their own advocates, their own lobbyists, if you will, for the legislation that's of interest to them. So Marshall started, uh, it's a funny story, Marshall um, was, was doing, people know about the Al Gore climate presenters. Mm -hmm. You can go and be trained by Al Gore to do a climate presentation. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, Marshall was, became a climate presenter and he did that in the, in the uh, you know, 2006, 2007. Um, and he was at a, a nursing home one time mm -hmm. and he gave his spiel and he was a little bit down in the dumps and he said that, you know, but he was concerned that even after giving these presentations, he, he didn't really see anything happening. And so, um, <laughs> Somebody in the back of the a little old woman in the back of the room raised her hand and said, well, what needs to be done in order to make something happen? And Marshall said, well, we need an organization like Results that's working on climate change. And she said, well, isn't there one? And he said, no. And she said, well, then why don't you start one? <laughs> <laughs> that was how Citizens Climate Lobby started. Yeah. Um, so Marshall, uh, again, adopted this methodology. He did uh, the trainings for the first several chapters that they started out in California. Um, I actually joined in 2000, 
uh, late 2010, early 2011. And the reason I joined was because from 2000 on, I had started reading about global warming and climate change and become increasingly yep. concerned about it. Um, in 2009, we saw the failure of cap and trade legislation in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, the Marky Waxman bill had just passed in the House, but the Senate uh, talks and bipartisan talks in the Senate collapsed. Mm -hmm. And so that legislation never went forward. And I remember thinking at the time, the next time we want to try and bring climate legislation up in the US Congress, we better have a 50 state strategy. So that was one thing. Mm -hmm. Where was I going to find somebody who was pursuing a 50 state strategy? The other thing was that in 2009, I lost my job. And because of my concern about climate change, I started looking for a job in the clean energy sector. Mm -hmm. But I found it very difficult. The sector just wasn't hiring. And when I started asking people, why isn't this industry taking off? Mm -hmm. They said, this industry won't take off until there's a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. So those two things, the 50 state strategy, right. the need for a price on carbon. And when I found Citizens Climate Lobby, those were the two main things that they were pursuing, mm -hmm. raising an army of citizen volunteers all across the United States in every congressional district. Mm -hmm. And then also their, their, their sole objective was to get legislation passed that would put a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. And you no, know, so I was sold. All right, uh, getting back to the lower falls, what kind of thing can you suggest that uh, people in the neighborhood here do to try to forward this uh, legislation and, and this cause generally, but uh, what, what suggestions can you give us? I'll tell you, you know, something you need to, to lower falls particularly is, you know, I remember uh, being in the, uh, you know, being in the professional community around Boston for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I've done a number of things. I've worked at large companies. I've worked at small companies. I did a startup one time. Um, and, you know, in conversations with people at my workplace, it was, it wasn't uh, that infrequent that some topic would come up and I would say to myself, you know, I know so-and-so back in Lower Falls, I could ask them about this. Hmm. And the, Lower Falls is actually a very rich community. <laughs> if you ever need to, uh, you know, research a topic or maybe get some advice about how to push a business deal forward yeah. or something. And, um, and so one of the things that's really important is that we need to get influential individuals. Uh, in fact, one of the, an aide once told me when I asked them, what can we do to move this conversation forward on Capitol Hill? Mm -hmm. They said, bring senior executives to the table. Hmm. So my ask to people listening tonight would be, if you're a senior executive, or if you're in a organization of senior executives, or you know some senior executives, um, I'd be very interested in, in having a Zoom coffee with you and maybe one or two of your friends and talking about this legislation and seeing if we could get them to uh, endorse it. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to do endorse. It's very great. Uh, there's a website for it. Um, but of course, I wouldn't expect anybody to do it um, without you know, first learning a little bit more about it. Right. So that's one thing. I would love people to connect me, introduce me to whoever they think might have interest in this. And whether it's as an influential individual or whether it's just another community organization that mm -hmm. might be interested in hosting an event like this uh, for themselves. Of okay. course, you can always go to citizensclimatelobby.org and you can donate. You could get involved. Uh, we have chapters. Uh, more or less based in Boston, as well as in Lexington. Um, so you could get involved in this. There are lots of things that, uh, lots of skills that uh, people probably have that uh, could be of use to Citizens Climate Lobby in advancing mm -hmm. this legislation. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, and you know, also go onto the Citizens Climate Lobby website. You can find sections uh, where you are uh, advised on how to write a letter to your member of Congress mm -hmm. um, and also uh, sign up for text reminders to call your member of Congress mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. Okay. Tell them you're concerned about climate change and that you'd like to see them co-sponsor the uh, Energy Innovation Act. Okay, very good. Um, before we go to 
questions from anybody who's uh, tuned in tonight. Was there any additional thing you wanted to just add on either the, either the lobby or climate change generally? And then Laura can uh, call in folks to uh, ask their questions. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, as you can probably tell, I'm pretty excited about this legislation. Um, I really think that uh, this is win, win, win all the way down. It's good for the economy. It's good for people. Uh, it's, it's good for businesses. It will reduce our emissions uh, and it's bipartisan. So if anything has a chance of passing in this Congress, um, it's going to be something like this. And uh, I just hope people in whatever capacity, whether it's getting involved with Citizens Climate Lobby or doing something else will, uh, you know, hopefully recognize this potential and help us get this thing over the uh, finish line. Okay. Laura, I guess we're open up for anybody who has questions and uh, Gary can take care of the questions, I'm sure. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Okay, great. We do have a question here. Um, Gary, would you talk a little bit more about how the um, bill fits with the Green New Deal? Sure. So, uh, you know, the, the Green New Deal is really interesting in the sense that it's, well, first of all, it's not a bill, it's a resolution as it's been introduced so far. And um, the primarily, I, well, exclusively Democrats are working on uh, trying to flesh this out with various uh, committees in both the Senate and the uh, House of Representatives. And the Green New Deal, you know, it addresses a lot of social ills that are important to really the youth movement that's pushing that legislation, uh, led by an organization called the Sunrise Movement. And, you know, I can understand the sense of urgency and anxiety that's felt by Sunrise Movement volunteers. Um, you know, we really have kicked the can down the road one too many times on the issue of addressing climate change. And so of course, something has to be done. Um, but the, you know, as I kind of alluded to in the talk, uh, what they're looking at is a lot of government spending uh, probably a lot of deficit spending because we're not going to want to raise taxes enough to pay for all of the things that they're talking about. And there are a lot of important priorities in the Green New Deal. So for example, you know, some type of a jobs guarantee, some type of universal health care, and so on. Those are really important. And I don't, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to think I'm against them for any reason whatsoever. All I'm saying is that instead of having the government or deficit dollars pay for a lot of infrastructure that's going to be developed, Teslas, batteries, charging stations, whatever it might be, why don't we implement a plan that would motivate private investment into those areas and get private investors to build that, up that infrastructure? I mean, we didn't have government building gas stations when we were getting rid of the horse and buggy. And we didn't have government building cell phone towers when the private market was trying to deploy cell phones. So why should we have government deploying electric vehicle chargers when the government isn't gonna wanna operate those electric vehicle chargers um, and some other, some private company would be perfectly happy to put those in place and take their profit from them uh, and, and be out there competing to to bring that type of inf infrastructure to, to market. And it's the same thing with solar cells, electric vehicles, um, geothermal heating, like I'm looking into uh, on and on and on, all the technologies that we already know about. They just need to be scaled up. And the, the, the free market is really, really good at that. I once heard somebody say, you know, government is good at preventing bads, but they're not good at producing goods. The free market is good at producing goods and the Energy Innovation Act will help motivate the free market to, uh, to reduce our emissions. Uh, we have a question here. How will greenhouse gas reductions be monitored? Will there be government auditing or self-reporting? 
So actually, we don't need to monitor greenhouse gas emissions. We know that when coal is being burned, it's producing a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions. There's no way that a company can take a ton of coal and burn it and get a different amount of CO2 emissions than any other company doing that very same thing. Similarly with oil, gasoline, uh, natural gas, when you burn those things, so as long as you know what the quantity that's going, the quantity of the fuel going in, you know what the quantity of the CO2 going out is going to be, and you don't need to measure it. It's a well, if they're well-known scientific facts. So as long as we can keep an eye on the inventory that's coming into companies that are burning these things, then we don't have to monitor what happens to them after that. We don't have to measure it. We will know whether we are meeting our greenhouse gas emission reductions by how many, by how much, what the total quantity of fossil fuels are that we are burning at any given, on any given day or week or year. Mm -hmm. And what happens if targets are not met? How will this be enforced? Right, so that's the 10-year uh, the moratorium that uh, in 10 years, the EPA will have to do an audit and they will have to see whether or not we're meeting, maybe instead of calling it an emission reduction goal, whether we are meeting a fossil fuel usage reduction, uh, you know, that's gonna give rise to the type of emission reductions we're talking about. So when I say, you know, we're gonna get a 40% reduction over 12 years, that's essentially equivalent to saying we're going to get a 40% reduction in the use of fossil fuels overall. And that is going to give the 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So at the 10 year mark, the EPA will be required to do that audit and to determine, are we reducing our use of fossil fuels sufficiently such that if you were to make the measurement, you would see Yes, our emissions relative to 2016 are down because our use of fossil fuels is down by the appropriate amount. Um, and when, um, so when the EPA does that audit, based on the number they come up with, they're gonna compare it to the table of emission reductions that's in the Energy Innovation Act legislation and they're gonna say, are we on track this year or not? And if we're not, full EPA regulatory authority stops, uh, springs back into place. And the EPA has to come up with a plan that gets us to the emission reduction that was mandated for two years from that point and puts us right back on schedule, doesn't defer the problem down the road. So, um, you know, I wouldn't, there are no, there's no enforcement, if you will. It's just that if we recognize that the bill, that the price signal isn't doing its job, that not enough private investment is coming in, that not enough businesses and household and, and consumers are changing their habits sufficiently quickly, then we will have to determine at that point, so what are the regulations we need to put into place to make this happen and get us back on track? Okay. We have another question here about um, retooling. Does the, does the resolution include worker retooling or re-education? So, no, it doesn't include anything like that. Um, again, we're going to start this bill. The fee is going to start at $15 per ton which as I mentioned is, is between 10 and 15 cents uh, on a gallon of gas um, to fill up your car. And you know we all see swings in the price of gasoline on the order of 10 and 15 cents every year. And so that's not something that is going to immediately throw uh, the whole economy into a tailspin or anything like that. We're not going to suddenly put gas stations out of work because a lot of gasoline cars are gonna be on the road for many years to come. Um, it's just that you'll be seeing a larger and larger mix of electric vehicles as time goes on. Um, similarly, you know, we're still gonna be burning some amount of, na of natural gas to uh, generate electric power. Uh, coal is gonna die off fairly quickly. Um, 
But these are things, these are changes, gradual changes in the marketplace that again, happen all the time. You know, when, when we went to cell phones, the government didn't go out and have legislation that said, oh, we have to, um, we have to now retrain all those uh, linemen, you know? We have to go tr retrain all of the people who are losing their jobs because they're not putting up telephone poles with uh, you know, wires attached to them. Uh, the change will happen gradually enough that people will be able to transition uh, as they need to. And you know, the, the concept of retraining, the American economy overall, and I think this is one of the good things about the Green New Deal, you know, the American economy overall, we need to put a focus on retraining and educating people, regardless of whether they're in the fossil fuel industry or whether they're in any of the other industries or sectors that are uh, experiencing really very disruptive change right now. The newspapers, for example, you know, we don't have uh, bills in Congress that are stipulating retraining of journalists because Facebook and Twitter came along. So, but we do have a problem generally in the United States where we ought to be, have, have better retraining programs, but that's a piece of legislation that we should be able to push separate of uh, trying to get our emissions down. Okay, we have another question about new technologies that scrub CO2 out of fossil fuels. Uh, yeah, so um, the, the bill will actually make allowance such that if you can capture and permanently sequester CO2, you will be able to get a credit for that. Maybe it's like a, a bottle return deposit or something. Um, but the key phrase there is A, you have to capture it and B, you have to sequester it permanently. And the fact of the matter is that doing that is very expensive. So if you take a, one of our power plants today, it's expected that the cost of power from a plant that is capturing CO2 is going to be about 30% higher than it is today. And when you have solar power and wind that's already competing favorably against uh, natural gas power plants, you know that adding 30% to the cost of power from those plants is not going to help them compete against wind and solar. People are just gonna go with wind and solar rather than building more, uh, you know, very expensive, frankly, um, natural gas power plants. So, Look, the bill doesn't say anything about that. If, if, if some really smart researcher can come up with a way of scrubbing CO2 out of the, uh, the smokestack of a fossil fuel plant and sequestering it permanently, then more power to them. The bill doesn't preclude it. As long as they uh, adhere to those conditions, they will get their money back and they'll be able to make a go at that business. Okay, I think we've gone through all the questions that we have. Just double check. Yeah, I think we, we're, we're all set there with the questions. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Laura and Jim and uh, Craig on the technology side. I really uh, appreciate all your help. Uh, to everybody who's uh, here from Lower Falls, and I see that there are actually a very good number. We um, exceeded expectations. <laughs> so um, I love that all of you showed up. You know where to find me. You have my email. And um, I hope that if you have other questions or if you can introduce me to anybody who might be interested in having a conversation about the legislation and potentially um, endorsing it or getting involved, I'd really love to hear from you. Uh, Jim, any other thoughts? Uh, just to say thank you to you, Gary, especially, but also to uh, Laura and to, to Craig for setting things up and handling the questions and bringing people in and getting their questions too. So thanks very much. I really, I learned a lot here and I really thank you for that. Thanks. You're welcome. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.